You violated the law. Pay the court a fine or serve your sentence. Your stolen goods are not. Ah, yeah. That's right. It goes in the square hole. These humans invading our land, bad. We, play as good guys, work together. Play as mammoth, play as bison, play as rhino, or play as panther. Okay, you get the point. This is Mammoth Otis, a cooperative game in a prehistoric world, where we use these huge miniatures pitted against the bad guy humans in one final fight before escaping this world. We each control an ancient clan of animal lookalikes to explore the map, build pillars called places of power, and eventually jump through a sensor portal to win, all through streamlined card play of literally just colors. There's some deck building, population management, and plenty of teamwork in this game. It's for one to four animal clans, or players, all in about one and a half to two hours. So uh, let's get into this forgotten history of the woolly mammoths in Mammothotus. Here's a quick how to play. We're all controlling a clan of ancients that uh look like animals, but are not quite Technically animals? Uh, ancients equal animals for this review, okay? So let's say I'm playing as a mammoth clan, you're playing as the bison, and our active figures are on spaces on this map. Our cooperative goal is to escape this land by building these four pillars of power on the map. And then, once they're all built, having a mini in the middle of the map to teleport away and all win the game. To build this place of power structure, just look at the prerequisites. So here we just do the top row one to build in a northern area that is yellow and we need a square and a triangle. These symbols are things you need to find on the board called shards of power. Oh, wow, I get it. Anyways, to find them, our minis need to go to regions to flip over these shards, then pick up and move over the correct symbols to an area where you want to build. Then take an action to build that place of power. Now all the shards are gone. Let's get to the actual turn structure where it's just two things. First, the bad guy humans go flip a card, resolve that thing, and then us animals do one thing. Let's start with us players. So we draw a hand of four cards from our deck, and then we pick our minis on the map to play cards on. Play the cards, and then they perform that color. That color, one color. See, your outcome always has to be of one type during a turn. So here, they all have to be green. Or treat it as green, aha. See, if our mammoth is on this blue space here, and we have a blue card in our hand, this blue card could be any color. So here we're gonna play it like it's another green. So playing cards may look like a mishmash of green and blue, but at the end of the day with region matching, these are treated as all green. Then I can move each mini as many spaces as I have played cards. Quick rundown on the colors. Green means you can move. Move your mini one space. Red means you can attack. One of your minis attacks by rolling dice to get two roll hits. Yellow will increase your population, aka health. Blue will let you build these places of power or deck build. After you play your colors on a turn, you draw back up to four cards. Then the humans go. The top card of their deck is flipped and it'll be a color, meaning that all humans on that color space activate. Yellow will go. So any human on yellow moves one space towards our minis or attack if they're currently on us, meaning players lose population for each human that attacked. Or if humans didn't move, they spawn on the board on that color on any trail spawn points. If this new trail card is flipped, add a spawn point for humans. Huh, more avenues for stinky humans to arrive. Then the next player goes. Just keep repeating the cycle of humans flipping over a card and then players doing one thing. Then just keep going until you build all your four places of power and win the game or the players lose by maybe a uh, population getting too low. Or if you need to spawn more humans on the board, but can't or need to do. Okay, there's so many things. I'm just gonna put them on screen right now. Yep, here's a list of ways to lose the game. And they generally just boil down to us players dying or taking too long. Speaking of you or your clans dying, now to flesh out what this population actually is. Yes, it is like HP. If you drop too low, you die and lose the game. But it also shows how many miniatures of your clan you can have on the board. 
The numbers below that here is preventing your clan from degrading, where you'll get useless cards into your deck when your deck runs out and you have to reshuffle. And for each blue card you've played, that prevents one bad card. One last wrinkle, combat. It just happens immediately when you want to have an attack red action, and you need a four or higher to kill one human mini. Roll as many dice as you have red value for that action. That's all the bare bones of the game you need to know for now. We'll explain more in the pros, which we'll go to right now. Pros time at Mammoth Otis. This is clearly a miniatures filled game and man do the minis all look great. Every single animal clan has four separate minis with plenty of details, especially on those rhinos and mammoths. There's also 12 human miniatures that clearly look like these prehistoric dudes trying to hunt you down. Oh, and then these bad guy three spirits that can spawn look intimidating. All the minis go on this beautiful looking board that looks quite clean with its full art. Look at all those bright colors. The stuff that goes on the board feels good too, with a nice outside finish for shards of power tokens, and trail tokens are dense and colorful plastic. There's actually more colorful plastic on your player board, which of itself is nice with no wasted space. But now let's go back to the minis, man do they look good, but oh wait, hold up. Mammoth Otis actually isn't that much about just drooling over the minis. That's right, it's really a card driven game. And man, do the cards pop. Each clan has its own art of cards, so you can see your literal mammoths exploring, or attacking, or doing some ritual here. Super duper sweet how your card's art matches that color miniature. Here you can see the wizardry this bison is doing with his staff and charging power. Or this panther with his arrow ready to attack. Or this panther is up on a tree. Cool art continues with the cards you can deck build with, and all the human cards you constantly flip over. So there's this gritty look where the literal colors you play is never confusing with the colors being on the actual art and on the bottom. Right, let's get to the gameplay pros, the game of us ancients trying to erect these four pillars. Now, we really like Mammoth Otis's card play. There's only four colors, which means there's only four different types of actions, and you can only do one action a turn. But the ways the systems of Mammoth Otis let these cards mix and match are really impressive. Remember, you can play as many cards as you want, as long as it's one outcome of color. Remember, one outcome of color because you can always play to region match where you're at. When you account for having multiple minis, maybe each on different colors on the board, your hand's possibilities are big. You're frequently trying to balance what cards you should play as what color with how many cards you actually have of that color left in your deck because your deck is only 12 cards, three of each color. So while it is satisfying to attack like crazy with three dice by dropping all these cards, you always have to think about what playing colors as other colors means in the bigger picture of your deck. We'll explain what happens when you deck out in a bit. Also regarding color matching, you have a nice incentive to match your actual miniatures. If you play a card that is that mini's color, you get a bonus. These reds are better at attacking, the greens are adventurers that move one space farther, yellows give one more population so they're caretakers. Anyways, this again layers on top of the cards being able to shift their own colors. Now you want cards to be a certain color and match the mini colors. The card play considerations meet the co-op here when you can help allies on the map. Oh, hey Panthers right next to me. You wanna play a blue card? Sure, let me help you with that. That's right, you can discard any number of the same color cards for what they're doing to boost them by that amount. But don't be like, oh, I'm the super selfless mammoth that just wants to keep giving. You get a card and you get a card and uh, Oh, my hand utterly blows now. Uh, my turn sucks. I can't do much on my turn. Uh, sorry, team. This goes hand in hand with Mammoth Otis's cool positioning nuances where you may want to position next to your allies to help them with any action, right? Move, attack, anything. In terms of your own color matching, maybe you want to keep minis on certain spaces if you have those colors. So maybe I'll just keep him on blue if I have three blues in my hand. Also, you need to be mindful of the trap of being stuck on colors because Let's say the mammoths decide to stay on green and then they've already used all their green cards and green lets you move. So then that means the mammoths can't move again off this space until they completely reset their deck because all these blues, reds, and oranges in your hand are not gonna convert to anything. They have to be green here. But then your deck can expand with this sweet deck building system. See, your deck is only 12 cards and to add on to it, you play these blue development cards as your action. Then you can pick one of these four cards here and add it to your hand, which sets up your next turn. And all of these types of cards you can deck build with are really cool to use in their own way. Let's go. If you want more attacking, just grab the double red. More movement, double green. A little bit of everything, how about a wild? Draw three cards anytime you want on your turn. Yes, sir, that's amazing. 
The crazy one here is the extra action card, which really explodes this game as you can discard it from your hand to take another action on your turn, as long as you can pay for that new action. This lets you do mad efficient plays of moving, then attacking, or attacking, then making a place of power. Just efficient swings that feel great. But uh, do be warned that you'll be going through your deck faster since you're playing more cards here. Remember how we said you could get bad, useless cards into your deck if you deck out without having played blue cards as a buffer? This whole reset is called a generation change, which really adds a lot of nuance to how you see all card management. It goes like this. First, check your population marker. Set your miniatures on the board equal to that number, meaning adding or removing minis, or swapping them in any way you want. Then check your degradation number. If it matches your population, no sweat. If it doesn't, you have to take that many useless purple cards into your deck. Ugh, these are cards that you cannot ever discard voluntarily or remove them from your deck. They suck, 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 suck. The generation change is mad clever because you're balancing the timing of all these checkups. The checkup could be good if you want to have more minis, three minis, or it could be bad if you're going to lose minis. But then you're also resetting your deck, which can give you access to colors that you've already used. Mammothotis is especially about knowing when to play fast or slow. Maybe you shouldn't play so many multiples of the same color every turn if you want to buy some time to prevent yourself from getting these purple curses when you deck out. Or maybe you've just used up all your blue cards already and you need to build a pillar of power on the map which needs blue, so you want to deck out as fast as you can. Let's really look into the cooperation though, where Mammothotis really does a lot to encourage constant teamwork to meet your goals. First, your team's priorities must be very firmly discussed, so then you can decide which place of power you want to build in which order. And then you can decide where you want to ferry each shard of power. Mammothotis isn't easy, and there's only so many shards on the board with limited time, so it's not like you can magically stumble upon some great combination of shards to meet your place of power. You have to plan it out. To get this planning really firm in this hard game, you're going to want to play with the game's allowed open hands. Dang, those colors are super easy to see upside down. Then your team is going to want to start talking based off everyone's hands and how they connect with one another on the board. Remember, the simple help mechanic of when anyone does an action, anyone else can help them, is this intertwining of teammates on practically every turn. It's simple, and keeps players alert of one another's whereabouts and hands. The teamwork gets to be a lot more big picture when talking about how to manipulate those filthy homo sapien crowds throughout the game. Your team is going to want to make sure that certain humans stay on certain colored locations for the least amount of damage to your populations, or to minimize how many more humans spawn. Even smaller seeming decisions, like where to move humans if they're equidistant to your minis, can spur lots of discussion, since players will all have different hands and thus differing methods of dealing with threatening humans. Speaking of how to flay all these droves of humans, Let's talk about the progression of Mammothotis and how it just keeps ratcheting up the tension as you play the game. As the game goes on, more and more of the neutral cards get revealed, meaning that there's more spawn points for humans. Or how about every time this human deck runs out and you have to reshuffle it, you need to flip over another prerequisite to build your places of power. Ah, oh, that just makes the game so much harder now and really has you rushing to build places of power before all these get flipped over. Oh, but then at the same time, you have to be really careful on building because every time you create one of these places of power, the humans love going there because the humans are actually also cultists. Yes sir, once these humans stumble into a place of power and activate, they perform the ritual, sacrificing themselves and creating a spirit. These extremely strong figures that teleport around the map and attack for up to three damage. And you need multiple die successes to kill most of them and they regenerate health immediately if not killed. Plus, cool thing that the rest of the cavemen just don't do anything during this demonic-esque ritual, so you can actually plan around trapping some humans by having them always time doing one ritual. The fact that spirits exist as a thing that can spawn at places of power, the thing you need to make to win, makes you really question the timing on when and where to construct these pillars. Don't forget though, us players have a deck building progression, so you can have attacks when dropping plus two red cards to have a ton of dice when rolling? Or you can draw three extra cards and then play three actions a turn by using these two extra action cards. That's a lot of actions on one turn. Yeah, I mean, there are also these hot garbage purple curse cards that get added to your deck if you're not careful. Mammothotis just has a lot of tools and threats as the game goes on. Now it's time for the cons though of Mammothotis. And first and foremost, remember that this is a, uh, we got sent a prototype copy. 
So the current rule book we had to print out with my black and white printer looks uh, like this. Okay, put up the original on screen. Uh, okay, that's not that much better either. To put it lightly, this rule book, color or not, is not good. In 2022, it feels like you're going through some prehistoric relic when reading it. it has no table of contents, really minimal setup diagrams, no glossary, no page numbers. Ah! Let's take a look at this eight and a half by 11 that ranges from weird to downright confusing. Yep, wall of weirdly formatted text. Or this, or this. So yeah, there's definitely some translation issues going on and the rule book feels extremely early stage right now to say the least. The ambiguity just doesn't end. Like what does an open place of power mean versus just a place of power? What does protection and perseverance mean for spirits? It's kind of explained through the combat example, but not too clearly. No, he's saying it shifts to, wait, this means... <laughs> wait, that's it, it just ends there. <laughs> no. Like, come on, I shouldn't have to go off examples purely to understand what key words mean or try to fill in the blanks with this, where it says movement and then it says a bunch of other weirdly formatted texts underneath. I don't know what that means. <sighs> Whatever, you get the point, rulebook needs work. And if rulebook is gonna be this confusing, at least include player aids, but the game doesn't. Sure, turns are simple, but at least something to explain how color matching with spaces works would be nice, and also how the generational change works. Again, changes are definitely coming, but we can only review what we've been sent here. Like there's supposed to be an insert, but uh, yeah, we just got a bunch of bubble wrap to protect the minis, a lot of bubble wrap. Functional, but a pain in the butt to keep using. And our copy didn't even come with dice to use for combat. I mean, luckily this game just uses generic D6s, but man, that was a little funky to see. The next con actually has to do with the asymmetry. Wait, what you say? Asymmetry? This game has that? Yeah, okay, so this is a variant that needs work. Players choose one of these five abilities to be used on any animal clan. This has lots of promise. By introducing these special tokens that you can spawn on the map by discarding a card that matches the color of your mini there. The problem though is that the actual asymmetry balance and the clarification of how the asymmetry works feels too much like an afterthought in design. There is one busted one called bait, where you can activate it to pull in all adjacent enemies to its base. And you can activate this after the human card is flipped. So you can set up this bait, not as an action, then just wait until humans would activate on any nearby space, then move them out of that color to your baited location. You don't even have to be there. Since bait influences an area and then everything around that area, as opposed to just influencing one area like the rest of the abilities, is so strong and maybe should have just been once per game. Like, come on, compare that multi-figure ability to this trail lock, which just locks one space from spawning one figure. Or protection that prevents one place from getting attacked. Again, why would we use those abilities if we can use bait, which pulls in everything to one area? Also, the wording on these talents really needs to be cleaned up in the rulebook and actual tiles because there's plenty of different terms like reset, hacked, and dropped that has the players fill in the gaps on what they mean, and it just feels jank. We're pretty excited to see this asymmetry fixed, so then you can add it on top of the other variant in this game, the human deck additional variant. This is something that lets the humans do more stuff, but it by itself added to the game is a hardcore variant that probably makes the game unwinnable unless you're really lucky, but we haven't tested that. Okay, so then what's in this deck to make it harder? Well, every time the human deck decks out, you flip over one of these cards and that gives the humans a permanent ability. Maybe now humans move and attack every time they're activated. Or maybe now humans get a plus one to their defense. Or you just get a bunch of curses. That sucks. The loss of being able to combine these sours replayability because the current other replay options aren't fantastic. They're currently just randomizing the tokens on the board and switching the place of power prerequisites. And switching the place of power prerequisites isn't a huge thing because the order of the revealed ones doesn't affect at all how you build them. Rather, it's the order in which the face down ones get revealed. But once you memorize what every single tablet is, it gets really easy to predict what tiles would be flipped over next. This can lead to a realization of the always correct destinations to ferry the shards of power to. This doesn't make the game super easy or solved once you figure that out, but it's kind of a buzzkill to see. Replayability feels like a big missed opportunity where it could have been better if the asymmetry was more smoothed out or if they at least added more ancient clue tiles. The last con has to do with the minis actually. Yeah, they look great, but 
they're all gray. And you see the color on the bottom? That's the type of miniature it is, not the player color. And that can get confusing. Maybe it's not a huge deal on who's who if you play with two players with just panthers and mammoths, but if you have a bunch of minis and you're looking at the backs of mammoths and bison, man, that can be super confusing. What could have been done is just putting a specific pattern on the bottom of miniatures. Like the mammoths could have a tusk symbol all around their base. Now it's time for the nitpicks. First nitpick, can you guess it? It's for a co-op game with complete open information, so you probably have your hands splayed out in front of you. That's right, uh, this game is a little bit prone to quarterbacking. It's possible for some players to just dominate all the game strategy, tell you that, oh, those symbols need to go over there and now, and then other players can just shut up and agree. This is because there's no secret agendas or ways to stop information to prevent the players from quarterbacking if they really want to. Granted, quarterbacking here isn't ever as bad as, say, pandemic though. <sighs> This is because players have multiple miniatures on the board and also their own decks that they need to keep track of. Speaking of talking, let's get to game length, where the game can definitely run longer than the listed one to one and a half hours if your group likes to deliberate on the cooperative elements. The time length for very talkative, careful groups of four can be closer to two hours plus if you're really trying to win. Last couple of nitpicks, these two red regions look we're like the same region to the untrained eyes, so uh, maybe a little more distinction in this split here would have been nice to see. And then for how cool the minis are, their bases don't quite fit on your population board, making it a little clunky. Plus, sometimes they block vision of your population because the minis are so big. Oh, and then the single player gameplay isn't true solo, like a specific solo game mode. Rather, it's just one player playing as two clans and controlling two decks of clans side by side. Mechanically exactly the same as playing as two players, so nothing novel for one player gameplay. Now it's time for a tentative score on this upcoming Kickstarter game, Mammothotis, The Forgotten History, where we try to critically evaluate the pros and cons of the game, as well as the caveat of, is this even a good idea in the first place? And so, Mammothotis is gonna get a 6 out of 10. It is above average. The score is really getting driven down by Mammothotis' jank. The rulebook, oh, this, this really needs fixing. Then of course, some stuff with replayability, which could easily improve by just fixing the asymmetry variant. This right here though, is a prototype, and hopefully all these things don't continue to be problems in natural printing, where the gameplay and presentation are generally great. Mammothotis has this really clever streamlined card play with just four colors and four actions, and one color you can play on a turn. But then the way these colors interact with each other and can become each other, all in the context of an actual deck to worry about, good stuff. Every card means quite a bit. During gameplay, you have to account for exploration, deck building, combat rolling, different types of miniatures, enemy spirits, population to manage, without ever feeling bloated with weird cards, phases, or rules overhead. As for player count, which we didn't mention too much yet, every single player count, gameplay-wise, is exactly the same, except for just with more ancient clans. Every player will grab one of these. The human deck flipping and setup is always the same, but with less players, you're gonna have more turns for each player before the game ends. That puts a little more responsibility on each player, and also making adjacency on the board a little hard to get with just there being less minis. With more players, there's not really too much more downtime either because remember, you can always play a card on other people's turns to help them. We will conclude that three to four players is a sweet spot with Mammothotis. The cooperative elements just really shine when you just keep glancing at everyone's color and positioning, where the game has so many turns where people pause on playing cards and sit and discuss on what the heck we should do with moving humans, or if we should kill them or not. Those humans are just on colors, but each color means a lot, just like your cards. There's gonna be a lot of fun digging through the human pile discard to find out what color the humans are less likely to activate, so they don't spawn again. Wait a second, was this world initially supposed to look frozen like it does on the front of this box cover? But now it's melted over in super vivid and lush looking land? Ah, uh, not, not sure what's going on with that, but I guess all the more weirdness that makes ancients want to leave. Actually, another weird thing, the minis are so detailed. They have specific arts and there's a backstory for each of them, but there's no asymmetry for any of them. Rather, the asymmetry is strictly tied to an optional tile. I mean, the game in its current state totally works, and we're not knocking the game's score for the lack of asymmetry, but it does seem like a missed opportunity to maybe let Panthers move faster if they want to, but not pick up shards when they do that. Maybe Mammoths could be better at taking damage. Or how about Rhinos can charge to attack after moving? Oh yeah, look at that. That would be awesome theme meets gameplay. And then final reminder, this game is hard. 
It's not impossible to win, but will require you to optimize insanely well to win playing without asymmetry. There's a lot of tension where if any player's clan gets eliminated, everyone immediately loses, so that's brutal. Also, luck can play a pretty significant part, where it's possible for three of the same human color to trigger back to back, or just always roll like garbage, especially on the rerolls where you need to lose population to initiate that. Or how about the spirits getting insanely high rolls to do three damage constantly to you? Yeah, so dice roller haters, uh, beware. And if you get really behind on missing a lot of attacks in this game, uh, it's so hard that you just probably want to restart. Shit. What? Dude. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, for those looking for a medium weight co-op game with a streamlined, clean, and cooperation demanding color system, Mammothotis is easy to just drop newcomers in and go. It's tense with all sorts of die rolls and card flips, challenging you right off the bat to have clever color management and move humans how you see fit. Mammothotis, color card play to run away from this prehistoric world before your ancient clan completely degenerates, like what happened to my brain while reading the prototype rulebook. Okay, so I've just been alerted that there will be a Taiga Clans add-on for this, which is four new clans and also a prequel game mode to the events that we just all talked about in Namathotis. Also, the deluxe version of the Kickstarter is going to have mammoth hair and shards of bone. So that's pretty interesting. Anyways, let's get to our personal scores. My personal score for Mammoth Otis is gonna be a 6 out of 10, an above average time. So the first thing I gotta mention is that I love the card art and minis. Like overall, the aesthetic of the game is really unique, cause it's super cool to have these massive animal minis running around trampling over everything in their path. The card play and deck building mechanics are also super unique, since your health, minis, and cards are also closely tied together in their mechanics. It's always a super interesting decision when you're confronted with having to decide between affecting a game state or benefiting yourself, especially because there's so many ways of doing both. Do you go for risky attacks, wait for more red cards, or maybe even use your teammates red cards? Do you worry more about health so you don't lose a figure, or do you focus on avoiding degradation so you don't add curses to your deck? Then on top of that, do you want to overheal so you can have more minis, or play a whole bunch of blue cards so you can add stronger cards to your deck? Plus, it's super fun how when you get a new card, you stick it straight into your hand, which is so much more satisfying than shuffling it into your like discard or deck or something. And it's a decision piece since you may want a card that will immediately help you, or the card that would be more useful throughout the course of the game. The card play is also surprisingly thoughtful despite only having a hand of four. This easily could have massively sucked, but there's so much positioning involved here that makes your decisions matter so much more than just playing whatever color you happen to have the most of. Thinking about where to move to make the most use of turning a color wild or even to set up a teammate are all very important considerations. Even more so when you have to be careful with how many cards you're spending so you don't deck out too quick or have a weak hand when it passes back to you. Manithotis has also cemented a certain thought I've had. See, I figured that always being able to do stuff when it's not your turn is such an effective way to keep players engaged. Yeah. I now think that's one of my favorite board game mechanisms. You know, alongside the usual me-loving interaction, tons of options, a small range of outcome randomness, etc, etc. But when it comes to stuff I don't like, Mammothotis is unfortunately still a co-op that is easily quarterbacked because its design doesn't take any countermeasures to preserve individual autonomy. Again, I'm gonna point at Gloomhaven and Spear Island as the ideal examples to look at, notably because having simultaneous action reveals and complex asymmetry uh, hugely disincentivizes optimizing other players. So yeah, Mammoth Otis doesn't have any innate asymmetry and everyone is super freely sharing all their open information with each other. So it's really easy to get a read on what everyone can and should be doing in order to win. Granted, it's nowhere near as bad as some other games with quarterbacking problems because in Mammoth Otis, there's way more randomness as well as incentives to be selfish via overhealing for more figures or playing blues to deck build. This makes it so that the gameplay works way better when players do some whack stuff that wasn't part of the group project plan. Versus a game like Pandemic where if even one person is deviating from the group plan, the whole table loses because everyone's turns aren't cohesively efficient. Basically, I'm saying that I wish Mammoth Otis had asymmetry and more hidden information so that it actually feels like jolly cooperation is warranted because otherwise it's super easy to just play solo as a bunch of 
players. However, I'm still ultimately pretty down to play this game's co-op since it works pretty well when I shut my brain off and just intuitively react to what's going on instead of planning because, you know, I'm doing this while staring at really cool minis. Also not a fan of how the random locations for building monoliths aren't actually random at all. It's always the same four locations, which really cuts down on the game's replayability on top of just being an excitement buzzkill once you notice it. However, I could also see my personal score going up later on when more of Mammoth Otis's pre-production jank gets sorted out. As well as if there's changes to the game's mechanics, because it really wouldn't take much to spice up the asymmetric tokens everyone can put down with better art or just making more upgrade cards and or ways to get them into your hand more frequently so that players can feasibly naturally develop asymmetric abilities as they play. But as of right now, yeah, definitely an above average time. My personal score for Mammoth Otis is gonna be a six out of 10. I have an above average time with it. So to reiterate what I've said about my personal scores of Gloomhaven and Pandemic, I'm someone that generally tends to lean away from co-op games. Yep, I prefer to be competitive in my games unless the co-ops have some really strong story and or narrative that I think is worth unraveling together, like uh, this guy, Manchester Madness, second edition. Mammoth Otis doesn't have this story grab, but it being a six out of 10 shows how impressed I am with it. The cooperative elements actually flow extremely well for me since I'm not caught up in intricacies of my player board or bigger turn structure, rather it's all colors, letting me focus on scanning the board for positioning. And even with just colors, turns feel satisfying if I play multiple of cards if I wanted to. Like I found color matching to be a fantastic feeling when dropping two or three cards, where converting cards to certain colors makes you question positioning and gives you a funny mini game of reevaluating your hand to be different colors. In fact, this mini game takes off when you get satisfying turns of dropping a ton of reds for big attacking turns. Sure, yeah, the combat isn't the most nuanced thing and I'd want to have dice rolls have the six mean two hits for more fun, but hey, fighting here is still simple fun with some gambling with the push your luck elements of adding more dice or rerolling your results that add some nice tension. Actually, yeah, that's the thing. Mammoth Otis feels refreshingly simple, yet still pretty substantial and not mindless. The overall turn structure is really simple. Drop one card here, flip one card there, that's it. Sounds almost too simple for me, huh? But then the game is hard, making me really think about how to manage the humans and how to roll our dice. Yep, whenever the bad guy flip happens, I'm always engaged and can talk amongst the group on how to react to it. Even when not playing cards to help myself or a teammate, I'm constantly pointing out stuff on the board, analyzing other people's hands or doing personal planning about my upcoming generational changes. This is one of the most talkative co-op games I've played. And yet I found that quarterbacking has never been an issue for me with there being a little too much complexity for our group to fully quarterback. Maybe with a lesser experienced board gaming group than the ones I played with, I would feel the urge to quarterback shards of power, but that hasn't happened yet for me. I really have to praise Mammoth Otis on how it makes me feel about a co-op without any hidden agendas or complicated systems. And you know the last time I felt like a co-op was this clean? It was for Pandemic in high school. Yeah, Pandemic in my first five or so plays with the homies was clean cooperation, where everything was inputting in info. Until one day we realized that you should quarterback the heck out of it to actually win on harder difficulties. Wait, so does that mean that Mammoth Otis, that also shares open info, will have this quarterbacking problem for me in the future? I actually don't think so. It actually implements open cooperation right, where systems promote more individual success than Pandemic where you have deck building and also your own placement of minis. Last thing too, I quite enjoy the theme and the game looks great to me. Man, do I love moving the big animal minis. Then these human caveman minis are fun to pick up and move around to get themselves some dinner from eating us. Uh, I mean, okay, I still had a really rough time learning this game though, and really hope to see the rules fleshed out and cleaned up a lot more. And maybe add more replayability because I'm very concerned about replayability here for my taste. But yeah, I quite enjoyed Mammoth Otis's time machine nature of transporting me back, not only to a world where we're playing as these woolly mammoths in this prehistoric world, but also to a time where co-op games that weren't too complicated with open information functioned for me without quarterbacking. Hey, thanks for watching the video. Again, being sent Mammoth Otis did not affect scoring whatsoever. And thank you to our patrons for making videos like this possible. Thank you all these patrons here. We also got our Mad Lads of Cardboard to thank. We got ZL, Jeff L, The Doctor, Peter Z, and that guy right there. And then we also got our Mad Lady of Cardboard. We got Amy.
Let me know what you think about this pretty cool, clever card play and the cooperation systems here. And let me know what videos you want to see in the future, any reviews, stuff like that. Anyways, like, comment, subscribe. Yeah, yeah, yeah all that stuff. Bye-bye. See you later.